we'll get started. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, a, a Michigan Fitness Club Association webinar. It's been a long time since the MFCA has uh, been able to do a webinar. So I'm very, very excited that we are able to bring together a, a panel of experts here uh, to talk about a topic that I, I think um, there may be no more important topic in healthcare and public health today than the mental health crisis that our nation is facing coming out of COVID. And to kind of frame up this discussion, uh, myself and John Evans, uh, who is a member of our Medical and Science Advisory Board for the MFCA, uh, started talking over the summer about you know, what is it that mental health professionals are doing in terms of incorporating physical activity and exercise into their practice? And could we survey mental health professionals in the state? And so that's exactly what we did with help from the team at Blend. We actually uh, sent out a survey to, I think, close to, to 200 clinicians. Yeah, just over 200. Yeah, here in the state of Michigan. And we got a fairly robust response rate. And Basically, what we found was is that overwhelmingly, the vast majority of clinicians thought that incorporating physical activity and exercise into their practice uh, was beneficial, but not as many of them were actually doing it as thought it was beneficial, largely because of lack of understanding, lack of resources, trying to stay in scope of practice. And so we decided as the MFCA to do something about that. You know, as the Michigan Fitness Club Association, we firmly believe we're part of the public health infrastructure in this country. And we think that we can be a informational source for evidence-based approaches to integrating in exercise and physical activity interventions into mental health practice. And that allows me to bring together a panel here, uh, two of which are members of our Medical Science Advisory Board, uh, Dr. John Evans and Dr. Tom Rafai. And then also we have Marissa, who works with John from Blend as somebody who has a great understanding in this area. So we're going to get into what I think is a really actionable discussion. You know, what I, what I don't want this to be is just a bunch of theory. Uh, I, I want this to be, and I know our panelists are 100% on board with that. I want this to be actionable things that those of you who are on this, who are you know, mental health professionals, fitness professionals, medical professionals, that you can actually take and you can do something with. Uh, so to that end, before we get into the discussion, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, first and foremost, we are recording this, so we'll send this to you afterwards so you guys will have the opportunity to view it again. Secondly, we're going to send out some resources to you uh, in the form of just a PDF, so we'll email that to all of you so you have the opportunity to see some of the, the evidence-based guidance. And then beyond that, if you have any questions about this topic, you know, I can be the liaison between you know, myself and our panelists to make sure any information that you need to uh, better implement this into your practice, have that be a medical practice, a mental health practice, or a, a fitness and a wellness practice, we're more than happy to get that information to you. So um, you know, without any further ado, I, I want to kick this off. Just really briefly, I'll go around and let everyone do a, a short introduction of who they are. So uh, we'll go Ladies first, uh, Marissa, uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to all of our attendees. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. As Mike said, I'm Marissa. I am the Director of Integrative Health and a Lead Therapist at Blend. I work with Dr. Don Evans. I have been a registered nurse specializing in surgery for the past 13 years, actually today, which is a little wild. I'm also a licensed professional counselor and work kind of with a wide variety of demographics. So whether that's trauma survivors, individuals struggling with diagnosable mental illness, chronic illness, healthcare workers, or even athletes over the years, I really am passionate about taking that holistic approach to their care, which obviously includes physical activity. So I'm excited to be here today. Awesome. John? Uh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, I'm John Evans. I'm the Director of Mental Conditioning and Human Performance at Blend Health. So while my background, I do have a master's in counseling psychology. Um, my doctorate is actually in the field of sport and exercise psychology from the University of North Carolina in Greensboro. Um, so my, my niche, my expertise a lot is in optimizing performance and getting the most out of um, our cognitive, emotional well-being and functioning and processing and people that work with me get nauseated by the number of times I use the word attention and focus or values. 
uh, in my work. Uh, but that's where, you know, my passion is, is, is in getting people to understand that um, by being more physically active, by engaging in sports, like we can improve our performance in a whole range of, of performances from the sports field to the business, to, you know, the boardroom, to our relationships on our personal health and growth, which is really what, you know, we're going to focus on today. So thank you. Awesome. So Marissa and John, very much from the the mental health background, and uh, Dr. Tom Rafai, more the traditional uh, medical background. Tom, why don't you give us a uh, little bit of a summary of you? Well, thank you, Michael, and wonderful to be uh, with you, Marissa and John, and everyone that's attending. And and actually, uh, Mike, you know, I originally wanted to become it, and John knows this because we had discussed this on the side. But I was originally headed towards getting a PsyD in psychology. My background in my bachelor's is in psych and pre med, not just. Uh, pre-med. And uh, my background, though, ultimately became one of medicine, internal medicine, but I went right into what's called multidisciplinary lifestyle medicine and uh, working with behavioral health specialists, uh, PhDs all the way around, dietitians, exercise physiologists, working with patients who really wanted to transform their lifestyle, whether by uh, uh, for purely preventive purposes or because they had a major life event, or if it was even trying to get ready for or uh, avoid, if you will, bariatric surgery. And somehow I landed myself after a, a about 20,000 hours of clinical practice and, and ending at the Henry Ford as a regional medical director for metabolic health and weight management, Magna International uh, brought me in as the medical and wellness director for this amazing uh, company. And now I still hold my role as CEO of Reality Meets Science. Here we are today. My personal story I'll just add is um, yesterday, my wife was uh, sick. I had to take my kids to a work uh, to uh, school and I missed my workout. And man, I'll tell you, I felt it immediately. By about 10.30 in the morning without that therapy, that drug, I was already sensing my ability to handle stress be less. Um, I have a history of binge eating disorder. I almost lost my life to it. As John knows and you know, I lost my youngest brother to it. And I spent two years on, um, on um, uh, Wellbutrin, and actually one on Wellbutrin and two on Lexapro myself. If it wasn't for activity, physical activity, although it's a bit of silver buckshot, right? There's obviously our environment, social support, and and so on, been uh, to many, many uh, therapy sessions, have given a lot of counseling, received a lot, but without physical activity, key component, I'd be back on drugs. Awesome. Legal, legal drugs. <laughs> well, maybe though, if I didn't attend to it, maybe eventually not, not legal drugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So only half joking there. Yeah. Well, yeah. And Tom, I always appreciate your, you know, your vulnerability and your, your personal experience with this, because I think that brings a, a, a very unique perspective. And so before we get into this discussion, just a couple of housekeeping notes here. Um, this is Zoom webinar meeting. You can see the panelists and you can hear them talk, but we cannot see you and we cannot talk to you. Um, you certainly can enter in any questions through the Q&A feature. I'll be moderating those questions from the panelists, may not get to them right away, but we'll uh, get to them at the appropriate point during the webinar. So you know, please keep that in mind as we go here. We are gonna try to leave some time for questions at the end to the extent possible. But again, if there's a question that you want answered that doesn't get answered during this, we'll make sure we follow up with you on that. So to kick this off, uh, and I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this because I feel like you know it's kind of the, the verbal version of doom scrolling, but um, <laughs> what the current state of mental health in this country, and I'll, I'll look to my two, you know, mental health professionals here, you know, John and Marissa. John, let, let's just talk about where we're at from a mental health perspective in America. Yeah, I, I mean, I'll hit a couple of big stats, but I think I'll end and Marissa can can add on with, with any additional information with kind of a jumping off point and, you know, some of the fascinating statistics that I think relate specifically to the, to, you know, to what we're going to get into today about mental health and exercise and physical activity. Um, so just in general, I mean, we, I, it, it's, it is common sense and intuitive, but like suicide rates over the, over the, during the pandemic have increased, right? So per 100,000 people that has increased from th 13 and a half to, to 14, right? That's doesn't seem like a lot, but, um, you know, having worked for the military for seven years and the suicide rates within military members, um, you know, one person, two people increases, you know, is a large effect size as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, those rates are increasing. Um, you know, substance use and abuse rates in adults and youth are, are both increasing and have been increasing. In general, our just mental health and mental illness within youth has gone up 1.25 or 1.24% 1 
uh, in the last year, which doesn't, again, doesn't seem like a lot, but is anywhere from like 350 to 500,000 people from the age of 12 to, to 17 or 19. Um, so those numbers are just kind of just not even creeping up in a lot of, in a lot of ways, shooting up. The big number that I want to talk about and, and some of these int more interesting statistics are almost one in five, right? 20% of adults in the United States are experiencing mental illness. That's like one in five is, is pretty staggering. But the, I think it, as we drill down into that, over half of those adults who are reporting mental illness don't receive treatment. So that has some major implications as we continue to talk about physical activity and exercise and the accessibility, the costs, uh, you know, of that um, treatment intervention. Uh, the other thing, the, the last one of the last things I want to mention is that depression alone costs the economy of this nation about $210 billion annually. Whether that's workforce loss or direct, inter, you know, hospital and treatment interventions, um, that is a, a massive amount. And then the general time frame from onset of symptoms to someone receiving treatment is on average about 11 years. So a lot of that comes from some of these, uh, a National Council for Mental Wellbeing, uh, some other women, you can, you, and you can Google all these, but I think the more important thing is for, for you know, Marissa and Tom and, and you, Mike, to kind of chime in on like, what does that, like, what does that say? And then how does that kind of lead us into a, a, a greater discussion about, um, using more creative, innovative, you know, physical education, you know, physical fitness, uh, exercise movement type uh, interventions for, for these, for these mental illnesses. Yeah. The, uh, the statistics are pretty staggering. I'm sure many of us have saw those statistics to varying degrees. Marissa, is there anything that you'd like to you know, add on uh, beyond what John said? Sure. I think to speak to what we've been through in the last couple of years on a global scale, I, was researching a recent article done in 2021 about physical exercise in the pandemic. And so we saw that people who were able to maintain some type of level of physical activity fared much better. And I think a positive thing that might've come out of that is it became less about appearance and more about stress relief, mm -hmm. anxiety reduction, and sleeping better. So what we saw in the pandemic was isolation, which overarchingly isolation exacerbates mental health issues. So if people were able to find some way to move their body and some way to safely engage with others in moving their body, they did not suffer with increased substance use. They did not see an exacerbation of existing or new mental health symptomology. And so I think this is important research for us to build from moving forward in how we move our bodies and what environments we move our bodies in. Yeah, and we're, no, gonna, I, we're gonna dive I, in. Go ahead, John. Sorry, I just have to chime in because what Marissa just said, I think there's a difference between understanding that, that physical activity can be an intervention and a reactive kind of treatment for mental illness versus the proactive like protection against deteriorating into certain levels of mental illness. Like that's a very, mm -hmm. those are different and both great, but that proactive aspect of it, I think is also um, super important. Yeah. And, um, you know, Tom, I'm just curious, you know, in the, in the medical profession, I know just talking to people like John and Marissa, I, I, every time I talk to John, I, John, how you doing? Slam slam and just everyone who's in the mental health profession and the people who are in mental health that are on here right now just more demand than what they can handle what are you hearing and what are you seeing from your in in the medical ecosystem well first of all there's a lot of burnout in in healthcare in general uh, physicians themselves obviously nurses and everything that they've been through we can't uh, um uh forget the fact that we're all humans you know the professionals that are providing the care often uh, largely subject to this, if not worse. Uh, but if I'm going to uh, add a, a little bit of thought into clinical experience, you know, the spectrum of physical movement from structured exercise, just getting outside, the building evidence that just being outside in and of itself has benefits and moving the moving meditation component of it. 
we're, we're definitely um, seeing a, a real uh, problem though when it comes down to metabolic health. You know that I've developed a kind of a system and thought process of lifestyle and, and mind matters or psychology is at the top, right? You, you can't get to the nutrition door, the physical activity door, discussing how to tweak your environment and, and accountability tracking tools without someone being ready for change. And, and with a burden of uh, almost systemic uh, depression and anxiety, we have to start you know, really there. Movement is such a critical aspect from beginning and, and just like John talked about it, as a matter of fact, when treating patients who are often, how long am I gonna be on these drugs for doc? Uh, and I'll and I say, you know what? I'll tell you what, let's, let's continue to, to talk about this, but if you add physical activity, Think of that as a drug. It's going to open up the possibility that we can start talking about weaning, preferably you're in talk therapy with Dr. John or Marissa, you know, working with me, but I get, you know, admittedly, I'm, I'm the doc. I've got some psych skills where we're trying to do a lot of other things. And we can talk about how you can replace pharmaceutical medicine with lifestyle medicine and movement as a major part of that drug-like effect. By the way, hence go back to my, I missed my workout and I literally felt the drug withdrawal you know, and I'm happy to be addicted to movement. I'd rather have that than uh, a list of others. Yeah. And so on that note, and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on this because personally, it's something that I find fascinating. And so I won't take us too deep down the mechanistic path, but I'm going to throw this out to the entire group. And so whoever would like to start with this, because I know we all have our own different viewpoints. Let's just talk about some of the mechanistic reasons here. Like we're not just sitting here saying, yes, exercise and movement is good because we know it's good. There is some mechanistic data that underpins the existence of this effect. So to throw it out to the group, who wants to talk first on mechanisms? Well, I love to. <laughs> so I'll try not to geek out too much, you guys. Um, I think one of the most profound ones that we've seen as brain imaging studies have become more, more improved over the years is that exercise is directly correlated to creating new neural pathways in the brain, aka neuroplasticity. So specifically, we see a decreased risk in individuals who engage in regular physical activity for dementia and Alzheimer's. So with some of the diagnosable mental illnesses, post-traumatic stress disorder, addiction, depression, anxiety, we also see in brain imaging studies the impact of the structure of the brain with those issues. So exercise can also help repair our brain biologically and therefore decrease symptomology of mental health disorders and stressors. I'll leave it at that because I can go on and on. <laughs> which, which is, you know, I mean, the concept of neuroplasticity is, is just so astounding. And, you know, I, I would love to dive into it more, but as you said, you know, we want, it's a lunch hour. We want to keep it light. Um, John or Tom, <laughs> do you want to, do you want to add on top of that? I mean, the only thing that I'll add, um, especially with the, the, from the brain aspect is, and, and you know, we, we did a, a, a webinar a year or more ago, you know, called train your hippo hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's a major area in the brain that impacts emotional regulation and memory and impulse control and is really uh, directly impacted by four, I think main it's drugs and alcohol, sleep, exercise, and um, you know attention training and or nutrition, right? So mindfulness is a big is a big part of that, and I'll I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But you know that that area of the brain does I mean does a lot for us and in, in terms of motivation and exec and then then there's executive functioning that that physical activity has an impact on and back to sleep and energy. Um, from a purely psychological standpoint, the impact of all of those things has you know, huge impacts in self-worth and motivation and confidence and mood. So when we start to think about, to, to Tom's point, like you have to start there, like as it, it becomes a virtuous cycle mm -hmm. of motivation, commitment, confidence uh, in what we're doing that then generates the habit that, you know, that we're all trying to, um, to have in our own personal lives and that we're all trying to impart within, you know, our client groups and, and the groups that we speak with. So yeah, you, you can't disentangle this stuff. It's, it's all 
you know, very much interrelated. Yes, we're here to put a put a, a spotlight on physical activity and exercise, but all of these things are, are very much interrelated. And Tom, you coming from the multidisciplinary background, I think you you can speak to that very well. Do you have any uh, mechanistic thoughts that you want to add on here? Well, I mean, clearly, uh, if you get into it being brisk enough, and I, I'm, of course, a big advocate of getting moving in any way, shape, or form, I think it can reduce stress. But we know that endorphins can provide an immediate feedback. We know that there's some research looking into how uh, there's an effect of, on serotonin and dopamine. And these are the drugs we're taking, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Well, we can do this in another fashion. And John mentioned something I think we we don't really discuss in terms of stress reduction, not just stress hormone reduction through physical activity, but the idea that you have this improved energy. Imagine going up the stairs with four bags of groceries and when you got up, it's, oh, it's really not that bad versus now you're, you're struggling up and by the end of the day, you're, that part of your willpower is being sapped by the fact that you're being dragged down by decreased energy. So there's so many paths that you can get to improved mood from immediate biochemical to long-term just practical, you know, Im improvements in function. I mean, how much does it improve your mood that you fell and you had the strength to not have a fracture? I mean, I don't, how are you going to measure that? I, I just, I'm pretty darn sure I don't need a randomized control trial to prove that if you're more physically active with better bone health and you fall and you don't fracture, that it's better for your mood than if you do. But yeah, and I you can know, confirm that from working in surgery. <laughs> People are not go. happy when they break their bones. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's it's fascinating when you start to dive into this in a deeper level. If anybody wants studies, and I know there are some people that are on this uh, webinar that you know, are very highly evidence based, and they want to see those studies, please, you know, we're happy to provide them to you. There, there's more than enough out there, um, and I really appreciate that perspective. This is not just some kind of a of an esoteric discussion around like, yes, this is good for your brain. Like there is there are mechanistic underpinnings to this, which are, are quite fascinating. Before we start to dive a little bit deeper into, you know, kind of the, the barriers for implementing this into practice, and then kind of how we can overcome those barriers. Uh, Tom, I want to turn to you because you do something uh, uniquely well, which is frame up physical activity, exercise, and kind of it's all of its ways, shapes, and forms, because you were kind of using physical activity and exercise interchangeably here. And while I think some of the fitness professionals that are on here may be able to distinguish the difference, can, can you frame this up? Everything from you know, neat to general physical activity to reducing sedentary time, just give us a framework how to think about movement on kind of its broad continuum. Okay. Well, I, I think clinically it's that we have a big barrier to getting people started and their vision is that they must get to a really brisk, uh, uh, with all due respect to Jillian Michaels, you know, getting whipped on a treadmill and vomit on the treadmill kind of that's what I need to be doing for physical activity. I think the data is clearly showing that it's a cumulative issue and that there's a spectrum of benefits from light to moderate to yes, more high intensity physical activity, but that where the lowest lying fruit is getting people moving and what we call, and this is kind of part of the engagement, being a neat freak, right? Non-exercise activity time, and yes, Michael and Marissa and John, we know it stands for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Let's get rid of the glob, you know, glob of a word thing and just call it non-exercise activity time. And that gets people to feel they can do it. And you start to engage and oh, you know, look at these blue zones, these longevity societies, they don't exercise, although they probably hit levels of physical activity that would equate to such. They just move about the day. And now we have evidence that's two minutes of walking after dinner or any meal can improve your risk of developing diabetes. So you give them achievable goals. That's the first thing you get them to feel empowered that every little bit counts it, that it's doable. And you start to stack from there. Now, full disclosure, I know everyone here knows I'm a gym rat. I love that icing, I, but I would consider that when you're talking to the typical person that quote needs it the most, the cake is really, how can we get moving in any way? And by the way, if it's, I'm stuck to a desk, can I just at least exercise and, and not worry about my 10,000 steps? I'd say yes, because they're the navigator. But don't, the whole, the menu includes the spectrum from structured physical activity to non structured to every little bit in that regard. You know, where you get two minutes, you can walk to the third drinking fountain. By the way, I've done this stuff. Instead of the first, uh, you know, all of those tricks you can play and gamify it is the way that I'd prefer people take the, the, uh, the approach towards physical activity. Um, 
from a clinical perspective in those that really need it the most and have not experienced much of it at all. What's the number again that, of people that are engaged in the American Heart Association level? Of, isn't it less than 25%? I mean, that meet, we've, we've, yeah, that meet the full strength and cardiovascular guidelines per the CDC. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's less than one in four. But so there's my there's my that's my case for neat to yeah. start as the as the cake. Well, and I and I want to point out that you know Tom Tom is standing right now, and you know even things like that are you know a good a good starting point. And you know I say that, and I think this is very important for for me to say as as the um, fitness club industry representative on this call. You know, we need to realize full well in our industry that the conduit to getting people through our doors eventually is the things that Tom is talking about right there. It's a big jump to go from I'm not active at all to I'm stepping through the doors of a health and a fitness club. But you know what, if you just add in a little more activity, you take that extra walk, you build some confidence, you build some self-efficacy in a way that respects your autonomy, eventually you maybe are willing and able to walk through that door. So I think that that's why I wanted to bring that up. And, you know, I, I think it goes, you know, for, for two things. It's one, the mental health professionals on here need to realize that it doesn't have to mean they're walking through our door, but we also as a fitness industry need to realize it's not forcing it. Thank you for raising your hand, Tom, but you know, you could just talk. Well, actually, I just wanted to mention many uh, patients that I've seen are so debilitated that actually the best place is the gym first because they get that. in some resistance exercise that build the kind of strength, by the way, prevents, mitigates muscle loss during weight loss if that's what they're seeking as part of their journey. Everyone here knows I don't like worshiping at the altar of a scale. So it can go, it, it can go in, in, in either direction. It really can go. They eventually will be complementary unless we all want to move to Sardinia or Nicoya, Costa Rica, or any one of the blue zones, or go back 10,000 years, or live as, uh, uh, what was it, Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway, right? You'll be, then you'll be in an environment where you will move or die. Uh, other than that, though, I think eventually it's a mixture of, of neat and structured activity within fitness centers, which I, I don't know if we're going to go there, but I lament in re retrospect that we close so many fitness centers when I hope if this ever happens again, we know how to run protocols so that we think of fitness centers as essential function facilities. I don't know if we want to go there, but I'm going to say it and leave it out there. We can just let it die or we can you know, address it at some other point, but it can go either way. Whatever way works for that person, just making them realize every little bit counts could start in the gym too. But, but a lot of times it will just be about taking, hey, taking the dog for a walk instead of letting him go in the backyard. Right. And, and to, to, br to bring this to a close, I'll just point out some of my favorite research from Stephen Blair that was published in the uh, late uh, 1980s, early 1990s that, that looked at aerobic fitness and mortality rate. And I realize different subject than we're here to talk about today, but I think it illustrates this point that Tom is saying very well. When they looked at individuals and their aerobic capacity, they found that when going from the lowest level of aerobic fitness to the second lowest level of aerobic fitness, they saw an over 50% reduction in all cause mortality. So practically speaking, what that means is that the biggest health benefits you get from movement go from when you go from very, 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 very out of shape to just very, very, very out of shape. Just take one very away and you see a significant reduction in mortality. So it's not going from 135 to 150 minutes that makes the most profound difference. It's going from zero minutes to 20 minutes of physical activity every week. And, and I can get on that soapbox all day long. We'll just leave that there and get to really the heart of the discussion, which I'm very excited to have is that it's clear that we all think this is important. And certainly the people that are taking the time to be on this webinar think this is important. But as our survey suggests, which comports with the larger uh, subsets of data that are out there, these physical activity and exercise interventions aren't being used enough in clinical practice. And we're going to talk about some of the barriers and ways to overcome them. And Marissa, I want to go to you first, because when we were having our planning discussion for this you brought up something which I think could be the crux of this whole conversation is that there's this very close association between physical activity, exercise, and body composition. And it, you have to really disentangle those two. So I think, as, as you said, there are some practitioners that are out there, mental health pr uh, practitioners, medical practitioners that are almost concerned to bring this up because they feel it might be weight stigmatizing in some way. So let's get into this discussion from, from your perspective on that. How can we talk about this in a way that, 
that disentangles it from body weight and body composition? And what are your observations on that? So, I mean, first and foremost, I think we just need to be intentional in our language as clinicians and think about our approach and how we can integrate that into the conversation and therefore disentangle the idea of physical activity from weight loss or being a certain size or a certain number on the scale. That might look like going to the biological benefits. That might look like psychoeducation. But it's critically important that we ask very open-ended questions to the individuals we're trying to help to gauge what their personal experience and relationship with not only their body, but moving their body is. So that might look like saying, how physically active are you? I do this in the first consultation or the first session with every client. I then ask how satisfied are you with your exercise or movement routine? Some people are gonna be like, this is my strength. I am so satisfied with it, five out of five. I don't wanna change anything. Other people are going to say zero. And so where we go from there really depends on the answers we receive from the individual. I think another incredibly important question to ask is do you suffer from any physical illnesses or injuries that impede your ability to exercise. Some of these more high functioning individuals in the realm of physical activity might suffer a sudden injury or a progressive chronic illness that then seems like it rips away some of their go-to coping mechanisms. And with every client I've experienced with this, I then see an exacerbation of existing or new symptoms start to pre present themselves. So we wanna gauge what they feel physically capable of and if there are any physical barriers to movement. I then like to ask, how would you describe your relationship with moving your body? This might reveal some stigmatization or an adverse experience someone has ex had in the past, whether at the gym or from sports, or messaging from family systems from a very young age that has narrowed their perspective so much so that it becomes a barrier. So how would you describe your relationship with moving your body? What kind of physical activity feels safe and supportive? So again, some people might say everything. Some people might say walking is like the only thing I feel like I can do. This gives us guidelines as practitioners of where to go next, whether that's referring to someone like Dr. Tom, whether that is identifying new methods of movement that can build their sense of safety with their body and physical activity. And so preferences for their engagement in exercise. We are going to see, especially as mental health care providers, some people who are, who are at a high risk for disordered exercise or eating, have body image issues, or are simply just resistant to physical activity. So while we need to assess and screen early on, it needs to be an ongoing conversation. Awesome. And Tom, I'm going to throw this over to you in a second, because I'm curious from the the medical professional's perspective. But I do want to point out something that uh, maybe everyone didn't necessarily pick up on there as Marissa was talking, but the use of language is so important here. And, and I think, you know, our three panelists, you know, would all agree with this, that depending on who I'm talking to, I'm choosing what I'm calling this very, very carefully. Because for some people, as soon as you use the word exercise, it's going to be an unapproachable word. So I, I'll call it physical activity or I'll call it movement. For other people who are those more exercise oriented individuals, that is a much more approachable term. So you know, language does matter here in these conversations. And I think, you know, for those of you that are, that are on this call that aren't aware of that language, I think, you know, being acutely aware of that is, is important. And, and Tom, you know, I'm curious from your perspective, because again, multidisciplinary team, you know, your, your flex five strategy, like you said, mind matter sits at the top. So you really think about this. H how do you think of some of the barriers and ways to overcome those for professionals when they're talking about activity and mental health? Um, well, first, if my connection is unstable, I'll let me know. I can hook up through my phone. 
I can't emphasize enough what Marissa has said is, is delving into the past and finding out what they've done, what they haven't been able to do, or their preconceived notions. I, immediately, Marissa, when you were talking, I was, there was a patient I can remember, Sandy, who said, no, my mother said that ladies don't sweat. Ladies don't sweat. And it was just deep in there. It was not, I'm not going to be able to get that out of there with a mic, with a, a micro scalpel and, and just, ex no, it's not going to happen. Uh, but what would they then therefore be comfortable with, or at least what have they done in the past? And maybe they have a, a skill that they don't think they're not confident they can get back to, but maybe is really a, a great idea. And I have to admit, I've really leveraged a lot of the health benefits, speaking of barriers to access. Many people have physical therapy benefits they're not aware of, and they should leverage. And many physical therapists and physical therapy centers have a gym that they can continue on afterwards. Uh, and certainly, it doesn't mean that they have to go and stick with physical therapy forever. I mean, obviously, there's certified trainers and so forth. We talk about an evolution, but that's one area where I know a lot of people can benefit from a professional to help deal with the anxiety over I'm concerned with my knee, my hip, my back, whatever the case may be. And on the other end, I, I, have, I must say, you know, a little, a little, I know they're overrated all in all, but I have to say that, you know, pedometers, which are built into, you know, all of our tumors, I mean, phones, um, yeah. are, are easy access to get people to kind of have the lowest level of accountability, right? To that kind of reinforcing, oh, I'm accountable to, a, to an app on a phone. But when they know they're going to be partnering it up and, and get uh, some feedback that's objective, wow, look at that. I didn't realize how much or how little I did. Those kind of three P's, if you will, past, PT, and pedometers are things that I think about immediately when I'm, I'm thinking about how I assess and then what I do from the get-go as it relates to starting to break the, the barriers um, towards getting into physical activity and then linking it all, always, by the way, with, with health benefits, uh, always, by the way, um, with a, a whatever weight is, because there's a lot of thought, well, I'm going to work my way to 100 pound, work out my way to 100 pound weight loss. Um, I'll tell you, the evidence that I see is that physical activity is really solid when it comes to maintenance. Uh, but when it comes to loss, it's a bit of a different issue. And I've seen, and my wife will, will admit this too, she loves exercise that I think is probably too brisk coming out of the gate. And then she has this raged up appetite. Okay, well, we're going to have to kind of manage through this. I think light walking and resistance training, a lot of that goes under the radar, but that's my, my clinical experience. But it's about your health, irrespective of weight at all. And, and it probably is going to help your body composition, whatever happens on the scale, because that useful idiot doesn't know the difference. If you lost 20 pounds of muscle, gained 20 pounds of fat, 30 years later, it says you're the same thing as you were 30 years ago. You know, it's useful, it's convenient, but it's not going to tell you if you're a good father, a good mother, a good friend, uh, it's just a scale, but it's, it's, it's something. Uh, but to kind of delink it and not completely, you know, admit like, hey, yeah, it's probably going to have uh, some benefits in that regard too. Now let's go ahead and talk about something else. Like I want to talk about more than just Neptune. It's an important planet in the planetary system, but let's talk about the Earth. Let's talk about Mars. Let's talk about the sun. Let's talk about other components. Although I do hear that it rains diamonds on Neptune. I learned that as I was reading a science book with my five-year-old. That's another topic. So those are my thoughts. Yeah, that's great, Tom. And uh, two things I want to pull out of that. Uh, you know, the, the first thing is, is that, you know, Tom is saying this uh, with regard to, you know, weight and the scale as someone that was a medical director for cardiometabolic health and weight management. So like, you know, he's the person that was involved in this. So I think, you know, for those of you that are, are medical professionals or mental health professionals, you're realizing that, you know, an expert in the space realizes that it's not the end all be all. The other thing that I want to point out before I throw this on to John is, is that, the concept of this multidisciplinary team, I think, is so critically important. I mean, it really does, you know, take a village to do this. And, you know, I think of just my relationship with, you know, even somebody like John on the call or my relationship with Tom. I mean, people that, you know, easily would refer somebody to because they have a very specific scope and they refer back to me. I think one of the things that has really prevented us from integrating in physical activity and exercise interventions in the broad population is we're just stuck in our own silos. You know, John has so much work to do as a mental health professional. He doesn't have time, even if he had the expertise to prescribe exercise. And Tom has so much work to do as a medical professional. And he actually does have some expertise in exercise and probably could prescribe, but he doesn't have the time to do that. And so developing these cross-sector relationships and breaking down silos with other trusted members of that multidisciplinary team can be so, so powerful. And I hope that's one of the takeaways from this webinar today is that 
you know, there are a bunch of evidence-based practitioners that are in your community that think like you do. And the more we can collaborate, the better it is for the people that we serve. So I think that that's important to bring up. Um, so with that said, John, I'm really excited to have you talk on this particular topic uh, because oftentimes we think of exercise as, a, as just a goal based endeavor, you know, your, your smart goal, your, you know, how long are you going to exercise for, how measurable it is, what's the time frame? and goals aren't a bad thing at all. In fact, goals are a very necessary thing, but, you know, talk about how this can not just be about somebody's goals, rather, how could it be about something deeper that particularly the mental health professionals on here might be able to consider integrating into their conversations with their patients? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, <clears throat> so I have two main barriers that I'm going to talk about, and I'll start with that one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, there is no, there's no doubt, there's no real argument in the literature that goals provide motivation, right? You look at any meta-analysis, goals motivate people. Um, I, I think the disconnect, though, is that if you drill down into what motivation is, you know, the definition of motivation is the desire to achieve something, right? I motivated to make a million dollars or weigh what I weighed when I played soccer at Kalamazoo or, you know, be able to still run two miles under 12 minutes, you know, as I did in college. That really has nothing to do whether I'm committed to the daily actions that it requires to achieve that goal. So we use these goals and we, we are over-reliant. So whenever I work with a client, I spend the first number of months just throwing goals under the bus completely. And then I eventually dial it back and we talk about, as to your point, you know, the importance of goals. But we are so goal-oriented and goal-focused that we forget that there is a necessary layer underneath goals that provides commitment to action and commitment to action that makes us feel valued and fulfilled and whole and that we can we can overcome adversity and those are our values right you know understanding you know what do we value and being able to define what those values are for us and even more importantly being able to define these are what my values look like in my daily actions behaviors and decisions so I can, I know that in an intentional way, I can move myself toward the value of connection and adventure and understanding um, in my daily life. I can do that every day. So here, okay, what we also know about performance when we talk about whether it's exercise or driving a car or taking a test or playing soccer or swimming or doing whatever we're doing is that our attention focused in the present moment is where we are going to perform at our best. Goals, by their very nature, live in the future on that time space continuum. So that is a, a one tick for me against the over-reliance and over-focus on goals. The other thing is that a good goal, weight loss goal, a time goal, a shooting a score on the golf course, is not 100% within my control. That's not overly motivating and committing to, to, to over rely and keep that in my limited attentional space. So values, by extreme contrast, live in the present moment. Right now, I am living and, and doing behaviors and making decisions that connect with the other people on this panel and connect hopefully with the people that are listening to this webinar. I can do that in the present moment within my control. So when I can start to dig down and identify what are the behaviors that align me with my values, I feel more enjoyment and fulfillment. I feel less fatigue, mental and physical, shame, guilt, regret. But the skill of values, of working with values, is that it helps me be truly become comfortable with what's uncomfortable. I mean, exercise is the best example of this. Going down and running on the treadmill or going for a long walk, like sometimes isn't, it's not always fun. It's way more fun to drink my cup of coffee and sit in the morning and just watch the news or just zone out and sit on the couch. But afterwards, 
we end up feeling more regret or man, I just wish I'd gone for that run. I wish I'd gone for that walk. So every, like everybody can relate to not wanting and being like the fun of that's inherent in sometimes doing exercise or going to the gym. I think we can all also relate to the regret or fulfillment that we feel afterwards from, from doing that. So this ability to endure the short-term discomfort that leads to long-term fulfillment and avoiding that very toxic and um, addictive short-term comfort that comes from, <clears throat> sorry, sometimes avoiding exercise or something difficult or something uncomfortable um, is the direction we need to move in, is, is I, being that, comfortable so, with that so, discomfort. Absolutely. In, investing a little stress to avoid a lot or the balloon mortgage. Um, there's something that you mentioned there, John, it's so, uh, and we talked about this, I think a bit too, and clinically, how do we see this and identify values over goals? Because everyone will come into me and have a certain goal. I want to, I need to lose hundred pounds. I want to get off these five drugs. I want to uh, uh, avoid a knee replacement. And then I just have one repeating question and it drills down. It may not be the first session. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? Why, 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 until you finally get, and they may not know why. I mean, I'll give you an example. One, because uh, I always talk, you know, I think, okay, example, I'm, you know, I'm 54, I've got a five and seven year old. I've got a pretty straightforward couple of whys. Now you can have more than one, but I don't want to be taking on 16 year old boyfriends out of shape. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm revealing too much, but my daughter is only seven and I'm already thinking, like, okay, now how am I going to take on this? Anyway, <laughs> um, one patient had said, you know, I, I thought it was my kid's doc. And uh, I got to tell you, I, I thought about it and um, I, 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 you know, I, I'm divorced. I, I was only with, with one person. Um, I honestly want to have a great sex life till I'm in my nineties. Okay, great. Cause I can actually, I can actually drill down to erectile dysfunction and the physiology. And now I can know, you know, what's your value now? Look, I mean, some people might like, Oh, what? you know what, by the way, sexual health is a very important thing to talk about. Maybe that's another, that's another session, but it could be anything, but it's not, I want to get off four drugs or I need my A1C to be this, or I want to uh, uh, weigh 65 pounds less or whatever. Why? Why? And then that gets them to their value that they own because I, we can't own that. And then you can, obviously, I think I, they work much, it works much better for motivational purposes once they identify it. So um, that's kind of the practical clinical that I've seen in terms of values versus goals. Now those goals, as you said, Dr. John, we can kind of bring them back in. Okay. Now sure. that we know your why, and then, by the way, be flexible around these goals because we're going to try. We're going to do a lot of what we call slip, stop, look, investigate, plan, stop, look, investigate, plan, rinse and repeat. Stop, look, investigate, plan. Just like a gold medalist on the balance beam. If anyone knows one that came out of the womb, a gold medalist just jumped right out of the womb onto the balance beam and said gold medal and didn't have to fall off 10,000 times in the process. Let me know. Yeah. It's, all, it's all right to slip. Yeah. And, and then the same bouncing it back to something you said, Tom, the scale becomes the like bonus outcome, not the intervention or goal, right? The weight Sorry. loss becomes, it will happen. Like I guarantee it, right? I don't, look, it's very likely that if you engage more physically and, be, and become, you know, habitual about a movement, physical activity, exercise, that body composition will improve. But by no direct intervention, by no saying like, this is what has to happen. This is what my goal is, right? Getting to that commitment especially um, in a sustainable way. I mean, yeah. people can use short-term goals in an unsustainable way that ends up rebounding and really not sticking because they haven't found that core value. The core value I find hugely sustaining when it comes to long-term uh, motivation. Well, I'm just gonna highlight one more barrier and I'll be briefer about this one. And that is, um, and it's related to values in the sense that values exist in the present moment. But the other big barrier that I, that I see all the time based on evidence in my own personal life is judgment, criticisms, and the narratives that we hold about our lives, right? I am a lazy POS, right? Or I cannot do this, or I will never be able to do this again. Um, all of that judgment and criticism uh, inherently in and of itself is actually very normal and not the issue, right? It's, it's how much we choose to get stuck and fused with those criticisms and narratives that end up driving behavior. Because if you watch only one news station or one TV show, like that's all you're gonna know, that's gonna be your reality. And if that's the radio station or the news station that's playing in your head 24 hours a day, then that's going to become how you think about 
exercise, health, yourself, your identity. So the, the ever popular but often misunderstood um, mindfulness and the ability to just stay present in a non-judgmental way. Practicing that three to five, three to six minutes a day of just being just a basic focus, notice, redirect, repeat, focus, notice, redirect, repeat, and being able to, to start to improve what we call meta-awareness and your ability to know where is my attention, where, does, where should it be, and can I get it there? If we can keep our attention in the present and be observers rather than thinkers, then we are reducing judgment, we're keeping our attention in the, in the present moment, we're freeing up attentional space from these narratives and the ability to pursue values more, more likely. Uh, it's, just, it's a valuable use of, of, of three to five minutes of your day. I guarantee it. Yeah, I, so, so important because there is so much of that negative self-talk that, that people really deal with with regard to this and knowing how to deal with it properly, I think is, is critical. Man, guys, this is just, I, I, we could keep diving deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and I hope that this just is a spark that starts a larger conversation with you know everyone that is you know on this panel and everyone who's listening and everyone who will watch this. Uh, we're coming up to our time here, so I kind of wanted to you know bring this together. And actually, you know, Len, who's one of our our guests today, is who's an attendee. You know, brings up a, a question that talks about breaking down barriers and being interested to hear about best practices and resources to foster relationships. And I think this is kind of how I want to bring it to a close with regard to Len's question before we open it up to questions for the rest of the group. Uh, I hope this has led to a higher level of awareness for all of you on the powerful tool that, that movement, physical activity, and exercise can be in helping improve mental health and address mental illness. I hope it's also highlighted the need for a multidisciplinary team. So I think the, the best call to action that I could give everyone coming away from this is to collaborate with like-minded professionals in your community. Um, and I think it all just starts with building a trusting relationship. I talk about this a lot for fitness professionals. It, it's, it's reaching outside of your narrow ecosystem in the four walls of your gym or in the four walls of the fitness community to medical professionals, to mental health professionals. And for the fitness professionals that are here, the best places to start are the mental health professionals and medical professionals that work out in your facilities. Those are the best people to start with. You know, Tom, you're, you're a member at the, the uh, powerhouse in Birmingham. You know, those trainers there should be talking to you and, you know, wherever, you know, John and Marissa, you guys work out. I mean, those trainers should be talking to you. And then on the flip, you know, I think part of you being able to talk about physical and activity or physical activity and exercise to your patients or to your clients, it's also incumbent on you to be doing that to some degree. So talking about your experience, connecting maybe with the, the trainers and the fitness professionals that you see in your environments that you're being physically active in, it just starts by developing that relationship. It doesn't have to go to referrals right off the bat where you're referring people to them and they're referring people to you. Maybe it's just resource providing back and forth initially until you build up to that point of referral. But you know, I can tell you from somebody who's done this firsthand throughout my 20 plus year career in fitness, it just all starts by getting to know that person and to start to have a, a conversation to build a trusted relationship with them. And again, for those of you that are not in the fitness space, I'll give you kind of a little bit of a, a cheat code here as to what professionals you should be looking for. Um, for the most part, it should be somebody who has a degree in exercise science or some kind of related kinesiological field. And it should be somebody who is certified through an organization like the American College of Sport Medicine, the American Council on Exercise, uh, the National Strength and Condition Association. There are some certifying and credentialing organizations out there that are kind of the, the top tier. And so that's very, very helpful to look at. Uh, the, the highest level credential in fitness uh, is the American College of Sport Medicine's EP exercise physiologist credential. So they have a pro finder on the ACSM website that can help you locate those resources in your area. And if you're here in the state of Michigan and you're a medical professional or a mental health professional and you're looking for a fitness professional in your community and you're having a hard time finding it, you know, reach out to me. You'll get my contact information when I send out the, uh, the post webinar email and I can connect you with a pro in your community that focuses on things from an evidence-based perspective, because, you know, that's ultimately what we're looking for here. 
So with that as kind of a call to action, uh, we have a couple minutes left and I want to open it up to questions if anybody has it. Uh, Len, I really appreciate that question. I think it's probably the, the heart of what we're talking about here beyond awareness. Debbie, thank you so much uh, for your positive comment. I appreciate that. Any other questions that anyone from our audience would like to ask? And as we're waiting to see if anyone uh, pushes out any questions, now I will tell you this is something that the MFCA is going to be getting a lot more involved in, you know, in, in the upcoming year. Uh, as many people are aware, certainly, you know, John and Tom, because they're part of our Medical and Science Advisory Board, you know, we were fortunate enough to lobby for and receive an eight and a half million dollar grant from the state of Michigan. And we are building capacity and infrastructure as an organization. And next May will be our second annual Michigan Moves Month, where we bring together multiple physical activity and health stakeholders in the state. And I think you'll see a large emphasis on this mental health movement, physical activity connection, you know, that we're really talking about here. And I, I would suspect that you know, we're going to hear a lot more from Tom, John, and Marissa on this. So I hope everyone has found this informative. I'm not seeing a lot of questions coming in. So with that said, I'll just toss it to our panelists for one last word. And, and Tom first, because he asked so politely. Well, I, I just can't agree with you more. The first thing is to develop relationships with special. Now, I found, for instance, um, certified trainers that had a little niche, right? One could speak Spanish. Another one really focused on those older than 65, but whatever the case may be, developing that relationship. And as you said, recommending, maybe it's not a formal referral, but you know, when I was at Henry Ford, we literally did develop a formal relationship because we didn't have a, a gym inside the Henry Ford West Bloomfield. So we reached out to Novi Powerhouse and they took on our patients for two months. And some of the, the relationship was so strong, sometimes a trainer would end up in a, in a visit. And I'd say, with, with a patient, I said, Who's this person? This is my trainer, and they wanted to meet you. I said, "Wow, that's great!" Uh, you know, it can't it can't be emphasized enough that we can develop a virtual multidisciplinary care team. You don't need them all under your roof mm -hmm. uh, to do that. So we find uh, really specialists in mental health, Marissa, Dr. John, vice versa with trainers and, and facilities like AFS and Powerhouse Planet Fitness, whatever. I'm not picking any whoever it happens to be. And, and just start to foster those relationships. And then of course, whatever they might have in their benefits, you know, could be silver sneakers, you know. Um, but I've made calls because they're so concerned about a membership. I made that, I made a call to a gym before and, and just broke that little barrier down and got them to meet with the manager to get that started. So, you know, as long as you believe you can, uh, you can help. Well, I, I think that that is probably a great way to take it home because we're coming up on time and, and mental health professionals and medical professionals that are on here, you are some of the most trusted resources for these individuals that come to you. They trust you in many cases a lot more than they trust us as fitness professionals. So you can be the one that really helps build that bridge if you build those great relationships. Um, Marissa, John, Tom, this was great. Wealth of knowledge, getting a lot of positive comments and thank you coming in through the Q&A feature. So the three of you, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Everyone who's been on here, please be on the lookout for an email coming from me that has a recording of this as well as a resource uh, that you can utilize in your practice. And as I said, if you do have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and we look forward to continuing this discussion with you in the future. So thank you everyone for joining us. Panelists, thank you so much for your expertise and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Marissa. Thanks, Tom. Likewise. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.